your early business days, how unhappy were your parents that you dropped out of college? My mother was not so unhappy. I had a hit record. My father wasn't so unhappy. I was a senior in college and Christmas rapping came out. I remember Christmas rapping playing on Christmas day. What was that moment like for you? Uh, it was magic. It was magical. My father was in the house. Like, you know, like, oh, shit. like, really? I mean, I, the next thing we know, we're on a plane to Amsterdam. It, it, and I'd never been on a plane. And yeah. we're going to Amsterdam, right? And they called me Mr. Simmons when I landed. I got off the plane, like, what would you like, Mr. Simmons? And Curtis Blow and I looked at each other, and I said, cocaine and sex. And he took us to, gave us both. This was the president of the right company. You said your dad wasn't that, uh, you know, worried about you dropping out. But I, when I was talking to Danny, he's like, you know, my dad was always worried for Russell. Even when Russell had $10 million in, in the bank, my, my dad was less worried about me because I had a master's degree uh, than he was Russell. It was always education first, mm -hmm. right? So the fact that I got four years of college and, you know, it, and it did, of course, the experience of living in City College, going to City College, and then that's how I saw Eddie Chiba. Mm -hmm. That's how I found hip hop. And that's where uh, there was a cultural thing that was happening that was so amazing that inspired me to be um, focused and, you know, because everyone needs Dharma. We all need purpose. We need something that really pushes us uh, and that we can give to the world, something we can give. Everyone needs it. And so finding hip hop put my head on straight and sent me forward. And that was in Harlem at Charles Gallery. The first place I saw Eddie Chiba was in Charles Gallery. Mm -hmm. I never seen nothing like it. I began promoting parties right after that, immediately after that. And what do you think you learned from the rush parties on your college campus? Well, I learned I could be independent and not do stupid I, I escaped. My life became too valuable to, to risk it selling drugs or fake cocaine or any of that. My whole life changed. And it was those early parties you were promoting that... Oh, that, the man, I, before I even started, I took my last of my drug money and put it into parties. That was it. I never looked back. It has been said that uh, you were one of the few young guys on the rap scene back then that had any, any long-term goals. How did your kind of business start developing from there? Long-term goals is a stretch very early on. I had a, um, a belief system on what could happen like tomorrow morning. That was unbelievable, I think. And I, I don't even say this now because I watched the Beastie Boy documentary recently. And they kept saying how I kept saying, you're going to be the biggest group in the world. Don't you worry. I promise you. And, and the you know, same with Run DMC and the same with you know, the artists that I produced and promoted. Uh, I was confident in their, in their talent. And I was resilient in my support of their talent. You couldn't tell me that the Beastie Boys weren't going to be successful or Run DMC. You couldn't tell me. And why? That I had an imagination. And, uh, and I saw where they could go. And I had faith in them and faith in, uh, in some ways, in my ability to push them. I was going to say more faith in them or faith in your own ability a little to bit of get both. them there? A little bit of both, because I could see the roadmaps on how to get them to the next level. Different from like seeing Foxy Brown and Jay-Z or Kanye West or all the other people in between. I was sure that Foxy Brown was going to be a huge star. Sure, Jay-Z was going to be a star. I had to be the orchestrator and I had to execute every little piece to watch the Beastie Boys and Run DMC and some of the earlier artists go forward. I had to see it and actually do it. You know, and I didn't have a staff of eight billion who saw the vision and were helping to make it happen. It's not as if, you know, you had this roadmap of, you know, successful people in your position or, you know, you had a lot of peers that were already killing it back then. So, like, what was it that made you feel like you could do it? I don't know. I just think magic. You can't fail until you quit. In fact, struggle is how you create a, a great brand, a great idea, a great business because you're refining your vision. The role networking played in your success, you think's what? In general, I like people. 
And so if they have pieces to the puzzle, I could dig deeper. You know, I can find what was good in them. Seemed like that networking kind of played a, a key role in your success, whether that's, you know, New York or- When I was a kid, I would go to, when I was a kid- St. Bart's or- Yeah, you know. St. Bart's. I mean, I would go as a kid to, to Hawaii before St. Bart's and hang out with the chairmen of all the companies. And I was just a kid and they were all very nice to me. It was all a bunch of old Jewish men and me. <laughs> Every year. And Jeff Wald, God bless him, took me. And uh, how did I become friends with Jeff Wald? He said, what's this rap And he was like, you know, Helen Reddy's husband and he's a manager of all these acts. And, and, so, uh, and he was, you know, like a big shot. That was my man. Like I hung with Jeff all the time. I met Irving Azops and the, the, the record people and, the, and all of the most senior people. They were interesting to me. I didn't, you know, I didn't come to get anything in particular. I, I was interested and what they did, and I generally uh, was lucky enough to learn from them. I like people regardless of you know, their backgrounds, their, their race, their re religion, their, any of those things. So that really helped me when you talk about networking, to generally love people.